what, what's the sort of um, what, what what's the entire scope of DNI? There isn't. I think that's the that's both the uh, opportunity and as well as the challenge related to diversity and inclusion. Because diversity and inclusion, you know, even if you look at diversity to start with, before I get to inclusion, it's all subject to interpretation. Right? It is all about human perspectives. Girish Ganesan, welcome to Rolling Stories. Uh, I really appreciate you making the uh, the time. So, Girish, um, we are going to talk about diversity and inclusion. But give us a quick sort of minute or two of, of color about your career. And 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 a question I always like to ask is, um, why HR? And and you know what what pushed you towards HR for your for your first job? I I, I wasn't certain that I was going to do HR. I actually wanted to pursue a law degree. But after my undergraduate, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back to school and do another three, four years because I was just eager to get into the workforce. And at the time, you know, someone in the family recommended that, why don't you pursue HR? Because it's a good combination of it might touch you know, aspects of legality, but you also want to be in a profession where you, you're touching you know, people and their hearts and souls and whatnot. So that's how I got into human resources. And, and when I started with Northern Reflection, my first job was a generalist job. Uh, it probably was you know, the perfect foundation because it allowed me to touch every aspect of HR. And then I could pick and choose where I either wanted to specialize or go into a business partner field, et cetera. When I went to Singapore with Manulife, it was a calculated risk. You know, went to Singapore, but didn't know what, what would this mean because I was there as an expat. So three and a half years later, I did come back to Manulife and I got a global role. And I was with Manulife for about two years after I came back to Canada. It was then uh, TD Bank uh, called me and, and that's when I made the transition. Here I am, you know, making, um, being at that inflection point again and now joining Standard & Poor as of next week. From a practitioner's point of view then, can you give us a sort of scope like, Diversity and inclusion, religion, gen. I mean, what, what's the sort of um, what, what? What's the entire scope of DNI? There isn't. I think that's the that's both the uh, opportunity and as well as the challenge related to diversity and inclusion. Because diversity and inclusion, you know, even if you look at diversity to start with, before I get to inclusion, it's all subject to interpretation, right? It is all about human perspectives. Uh, diversity is about the food we eat, the culture we come from. It's also about thought process. It's about the experience and skills that people bring to the table. I think in the corporate world, there's a definition attached to it because there are certain areas as it relates to diversity that generally you know, corporations have to make progress against. The inclusion then, what, 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 what's the actual definition, if I can say that, and the practical manifestation of inclusion. So diversity is being invited to a party, but inclusion is about being asked to dance in the party. You know, if inclusion exists, because inclusion is all about the culture uh, that exists within uh, an, a, an organization, and if inclusion exists, diversity will come. But what the last two and a half years has, have taught us and why it's uh, brought diversity and inclusion into the focus is because the society is so polarized. And so employees, uh, such as including myself, are looking up to their employers to say, well, what are you going to do about this? And as a result, focus on inclusion is equally important because you could include, you can increase diversity within your workforce, but if inclusion doesn't exist, you're going to have a problem with attracting, retaining uh, talent because they're probably not going to stay because they're going to realize that your uh, your diversity agenda is really about tokenism. And, well, and and I have to say, Girish, the the party metaphor I think for me anyway beautifully summarizes that diversity inclusion purpose is a big thing that that uh, you know is getting a lot of airplay and and of course um, uh, ESG environmental social and governance. Any kind of thoughts on on how those fit together? To, to sort of answer your question when it comes to purpose and ESG, 
you know, as much as private sector is there to make profit, but purpose of a profit is what is going to result in who's going to be the employer of choice as we look into the future. And I think that's where ESG comes in. Um, there's so much focus on what, how the organizations are standing up for climate change, social financial inclusion, and just the whole social crises over the last couple of years have put so much pressure on the private sector to respond to what are you going to do for the greater good? Uh, and, and that's where ESG kicks in. Right. So that's, that's almost the final thing that hooked you to, uh, to get in there. Uh, one, of, one of the things, Girish, that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, you, you made an interesting comment that DNI can sometimes be polarizing. And I, I, I think if I'm not wrong, you, you were saying it can be continent specific. Right. Give me some more sort of uh, uh, thinking around wh wh how you came to that conclusion or, or, or what you saw or wh why you think that's the case. I think general societal issues help shape up what the diversity and inclusion focus needs to be based on the geography or the continent that you're operating in. Having said that, though, you know, having lived in both North America and Asia, you do you do realize where the gaps might be when it comes to just human interaction and how does that influence your people agenda when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So in, in North America, it's a centuries old issue, right? We, we still have a gender gap when it comes to workforce representation. Same goes for racial equity, right? Whether it's programs and practices within an organization or generally speaking, the, 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 the George Floyd murder last year clearly laid out for us that, you know, from a humanity perspective as well, there is a divide. In Asia, um, you know, if I was to take India as an example where I grew up, it's very difficult to pinpoint and say that there is a racial divide, but there clearly, there's clearly a divide on the basis of which region of India you come from, you know. So if, if, you're, if you're from north versus south, people still label you as North Indian versus South Indian versus saying you're an Indian. And India is just a microcosm of, you know, the rest of Asia. Having said that, though, there's another layer of complexity uh, that, that applies globally. There still needs to be acceptance around disability status. And then sexual orientation, you know, LGBT, uh, Q2 plus status, it is definitely more actively talked about in the Western world but not so much in the non-Western world. I think there still needs to be a lot of acceptance around that. And I think that's where religious beliefs kick in, where there's still not a lot of acceptance when it comes to sexual orientation. I'll get on to sort of uh, actual programs of, of diversity and inclusion. But one of the things you and I discussed is whether, um, you know, companies have targets, right? So, uh, and I, I'm interested in your view of whether targets work and i think we also discussed on whether you then have you ever seen does it make sense that then performance and 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 rewards are linked to the achievement of dni um targets so st start off then with you know uh, diversity inclusion targets good or bad thing you know i i do believe in the fact that what gets measured gets done so having performance targets do help to drive accountability across the organization uh, because then people, just, just like a corporate strategy plan and the financials that are attached to it, when you know you have a revenue target or you have an expense target, you're going to stick to it because you know your performance is going to be linked to that. And, and diversity is no different. Uh, I think diversity has to be, instead of sort of treating diversity as its own agenda, it needs to be in, integrated into the fabric of corporate strategy and the talent strategy of the organization. And which obviously means that in order to drive accountability, you need to have some measurable goals as a result. So I do believe having measurable goals makes a difference. Absolutely. What about then the link of rewards to those goals? I didn't meet my diversity uh, target. I get my bonus clipped or something like that. Have you seen it? Do you, would you support that? Linking diversity goals to rewards and recognition, personally, I do feel um, you know, if, if you're driving accountability and if you don't meet the goals that you have in place, there needs to be repercussion as a result. Otherwise, you know, the, the goals are going to slip. 
So there is a direct linkage to having diversity goals and then linking them to rewards and recognition. Can you give us a sense of like from your from your TD experience? I mean, how do how do you boil down diversity and inclusion to actually things that happen in the organization? Is there training on different sort of um, diverse uh, cultures or uh, it, and, and of course, it, did it work its way into recruitment programs and so forth? Can you give us a sense of like the actual tangible stuff that that comes out? You know, it's very important that, first of all, your diversity and inclusion uh, goals and strategies link to your talent agenda. And, and what I mean by that is it needs to be embedded in the entire employee life cycle how you attract people to your organization, which includes your recruitment practices, how you're making sure the unconscious bias through your recruitment practices and policies and processes are kept in check. There's a lot of technological advancement that has taken place with AI that allows you to keep those unconscious biases in check. Then, you know, let's move on to the fact that you have to prepare your hiring managers to make sure that they are also presenting their best selves in terms of an inclusive culture of an organization and are trained to keep their unconscious bias in check. And, you know, those things are not taught in school. So you do need to have training and educational programs. Um, and in my past history with various organizations that I've worked with, we have had interview and selection best practices program that consciously teaches hiring managers on how to keep your unconscious bias in check when you're interviewing somebody. So there's that piece. Let's say you, know, you bring the employee, the candidate that uh, you, you, you decided to offer job to into the organization. Your onboarding process has to be very inclusive. So diversity and inclusion is also embedded in how you onboard everybody. And then you know, through the entire employee life cycle, how you performance manage, you know, your pay equity, um, your um, learning and development programs all have to be inclusive. Um, and reflective of diversity and inclusion practices. Last thing, a couple of things to wrap up. When you and I talked, you, you also, if I'm not wrong, you mentioned the word allyship. And it almost, it almost felt to me that you were saying that diversity and inclusion is, is both ways because there is a tendency to focus on those targets about, I don't know, those minorities or those um, people that we need to build up. But at the same time, if diversity and inclusion is truly inclusive, it is holistic. So just tell me a little bit what you meant about allyship. In simple words, allyship is all about supporting each other as human beings. Obviously, it has several layers of complexity depending upon what particular in what context you're talking about. But what I what I meant by you know that we all have to support each other and allyship goes both ways. This goes back to the different complexities that we talked about when you take the definition of diversity and inclusion across different continents of the world, right? So minority in Asia is defined very differently versus minority in US and Canada. Minority in Asia is largely dictated by maybe the country you come from and the size of the population that exists within that country or maybe the religion that you, that you represent but it is not the color of your skin. Um, but in, in North America, it's largely based on race and ethnicity. A bunch of us who would be considered minorities in North America, we're likely not in minority in Asia. But having said that though, my allyship needs to exist amongst the entire minority population that would be considered minority in North America. I also think even from a gender uh, allyship perspective, women need to support other women. And, and that's what I meant, that